president of the American Educational Research Association. When we decided to put this session together, several people said, are you crazy? 12 people on a panel, how is that gonna work? Well, it's going to work this way. We had extensive planning before today arrived, and we developed some questions. Each of the panelists knows what their question is, and the overall purpose is to begin to think about how we can link our struggles and understand the interrelated nature of our experiences. So this is highlights. It isn't an in-depth discussion. Certainly the illustrious people we have with us today could take the whole session individually to talk about their expertise and what they know. We're getting a sample, a perspective, a point of view in order to feel like what it would be like if we really did join up to link our struggles and understand the nature of our common experiences and our different experiences. So I've asked each panelist to say who they are. This session is being live recorded, live streamed. So I'm not going to give extensive introductions at this point, but they will tell us something about who they are in relation to the question that they're going to answer. Hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end for audience interaction. If we don't, you'll say it was great anyway. Um, one other announcement, I'd like to recognize Congressman Mike Honda, who is here. We thank him very much for being able to add this session to his schedule. And he has agreed to stay with us for about 20 or 30 minutes after the session. So we invite anyone who's here who has the time, please stay on and the Congressman will have some time to amplify his remarks. But we will take a short break so that those who might need to leave can go out and some others may be coming in. So we do really appreciate that this is a unique opportunity to hear multiple voices about what is happening in our worlds. So I'm going to start with Alan Parker. Alan, tell us who you are. And uh, your question is, how would you describe the common ground that exists between African and Native communities, African American and Native communities? Can you talk about historic damages due to the actions of the US government officials, historical traumas that might impact us today, and pathways to healing or common recovery strategies. And Sharon's gonna be timing you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joyce, and it's a real honor and a privilege to join uh, you and the other members on our panel. Uh, Congressman Honda, we're uh, looking forward to hearing, I think, from each of the panelists but to respond to your question, Joyce, and uh, to introduce myself very briefly, I'm a, I'm a proud citizen of the Chippewa Cree Tribal Nation, which is located on the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation in northern Montana. And I also uh, practiced law for 20 years in Washington, D.C., before taking on the role of an academic. And, uh, so I am currently uh, working as an adjunct faculty to Te Whare Wanaga o Awanui which is the Maori Indigenous University. And the previous speaker this afternoon, uh, Graham Smith, uh, gave such a wonderful description and, and presentation of the, uh, the history and the goals and the struggles uh, of those who are involved with the creation and, and the work of the Maori University. But briefly, uh, he introduced the fact that the Wanaga is also uh, working with a small group of uh, tribal students from the US who are located in the Pacific Northwest, where, where I am now based. And those students were enrolled in the PhD program that the Maori University uh, initiated about uh, 15 years ago, and uh, now uh, they are now in their second year of their PhD uh, studies and their work on their doctorate. So, uh, 
But to respond to your question, uh, Joyce, about the uh, how do we link our struggles in the context of the historical trauma that our people have suffered at the hands of the United States government and at the dominant society in this country. Because I think we have a tremendously common ground to work with that we start from as we begin to work together to address our struggles and to consider how we might link our struggles and pursue our, uh, our efforts and to, uh, to create an alliance among our people. So uh, briefly, the historical uh, trauma that we uh, in the Native American community uh, in the United States are dealing, dealing with, I think, are um, dealt, <laughs> start primarily with the uh, disruption that occurred when the United States government uh, was founded. Uh, they engaged uh, in warfare against our native people for a period of about 50 to 100 years, depending on where you measure those starting points and ending points. But let me address the ending point which I think historians generally identify as the uh, 1890 massacre at Wounded Knee, South Dakota, where the U.S. Cavalry slaughtered over 250 uh, uh, remnants of Big Bear's band of Lakota Indian people. At that time, historians uh, estimate that the population of uh, tribal people that still remained in the United States were numbered roughly at 250,000. Now, I think you compare that to uh, historical estimates of the population of the indigenous people of this country. When the uh, colonizers first came across the Atlantic Ocean at about 25 million people. So that is such a, a drastic you know, uh, decimation of our, the population of our people uh, from over that time span. So I think we look at where we are today, and it's, of course, I think, a miracle that we survived at all. But yet our people were uh, blessed with a common commitment, a, a sense of resilience that was based on their cultural identity, who they were. And again, I'll reference the uh, speaker that preceded us, uh, Graham, and he spoke in terms of the uh, cultural identity of the Maori people, the indigenous people of the uh, country of New Zealand. And they have set, I think, a standard for the indigenous people of the world in terms of what they've been able to accomplish, and that is based on their assertion of their cultural identity. Now, I think if we look across the United States, a, a similar revival has been occurring over the past 25 to 30 years uh, based on the successful assertion of our native cultural identity. And this has been embraced by the leadership across Native America and has been something adopted by the uh, educational establishment that has been uh, working with our, our tribal people all across this country. So let me, uh, though, switch briefly to some of the other major elements that uh, constitute the historical trauma that we have uh, been dealing with historically. Uh, you're probably familiar, as most of you on the panel are all, I think, highly educated people, very uh, aware of the uh, uh, his historical trauma inflicted by the establishment of federal Indian boarding schools, where children were literally captured, taken out of their communities, and collected together in a collection of Indian boarding schools and were uh, in, 
uh, imposed upon them was a form of cultural uh, genocide. The government attempted to rob them of their language, rob them of their cultural identity, and transform them into good little Indians. <laughs> now, that sort of trauma was inflicted upon us. And I would just briefly compare that to the trauma that the African American people in this country are dealing with. I mean, uh, we're not uh, at all interested in trying to compare in a sense of, you know, say who had more or who had the worst, you know, uh, historical trauma. But I think certainly uh, in this country, the American public at least has been somewhat educated by uh, tremendous uh, efforts made uh, by the African-American people to uh, educate them in terms of what that meant to survive generations of slavery. Now, this kind of trauma has long-lasting impacts upon the community. So I think that we look at what is the best approach that we can take to deal with these impacts and I think that the key is to look to our cultural uh, inheritance, to look to how our people still exist as a people that have embraced their indigenous culture, find a positive identity in that culture, and build upon that to create a world for themselves. So uh, I will you know, wrap it up at this point, but uh, I, uh, I'm looking forward to you know, the remarks of our fellow panelists, and thank you again for the opportunity to take part in this. Thank you, Alan Parker. Our next panelist is Jesse Hagopian. Did I say your name right, Jesse? You did, you did. thank you. So please tell us who you are, and Jesse, your question mm -hmm. is, in light of your recent experience as a teacher and a participant in a growing movement of parents, students, teachers, and other educators who see themselves as test defiers, what do you see to be critical, the critical elements that allowed your high school students, Garfield High School, to prevail in its boycott of standardized tests? And why is this a part of the civil rights movement? Well, thank you, Dr. King, for uh, including me on this panel. It's a real honor to be here with you all this afternoon. And uh, my name is Jesse Hagopian. I teach history at Garfield High School in Seattle. I'm also the Black Student Union advisor there. And I'm an associate editor for Rethinking Schools. And I just came out with a book called More Than a Score, The New Uprising Against High Stakes Testing. And in it, I tell the story of the boycott at Garfield High School. And it started for me with a phone call. I'm sitting at my desk in the middle of the day and the phone rings and it's a Mallory Clark, an esteemed reading teacher at Garfield High School, who says she needs to talk to me after school. And I was the building rep for the union there, so I'm used to getting calls from teachers to clarify the contract or discuss some dispute. So I didn't think much of it till I saw the look on her face after school and saw her peering around the corner, making sure no one was around, asked me to sit down, and I knew this was going to be something serious. And uh, she looked me in the eye and said, I'm not going to administer the measures of academic progress test this year. And I wanted to just jump up on the table and pump my fist <laughs> because this was a test that I had helped pass a resolution against in my union but that was a more symbolic act, you know. It was an important step to say we don't think this test has any validity, but here was a teacher who was going to take direct action to refuse. And right away we discussed how if it was just her, the district would quickly isolate and punish. So how are we going to make this a building-wide revolt? And she said there's others who are interested in this. We began holding meetings department by department and we heard from the English language learning department that this test was culturally and linguistically inappropriate and humiliating to students. We heard from the special education department the, the lack of accommodations for the IEPs. We heard from the librarian whose library is shut down three times a year to administer this computer-based exam 
on the computer labs there. And so here, as a history teacher, I can't assign research projects for weeks at a time, three times a year, because our libraries are shut down for learning and only open for ranking and sorting our kids. And, you know, we had the math teacher who taught algebra say, you know, I looked at the over the shoulder of a kid taking this test and I saw geometry questions on it. And here he is, a, a ninth grade algebra teacher. And he said, that would be like if a Spanish teacher saw French questions on the test. Okay, yeah, it's foreign language, <laughs> but it's not the same subject. And so there was universal disagreement with this test. We all knew it wasn't giving us information that could really drive uh, instruction or help us assess what our students knew. But what were we going to do about it? We called an all-staff meeting, and uh, we discussed all of our objections. But they said, you're the building rep. What's going to happen if we refuse to administer this? And I couldn't sugarcoat it. I told them, if we refuse, you can be labeled insubordinate. And then you can be disciplined, even terminated. And those were not the words that sparked the MAP test boycott. It was actually another teacher who stood up and said, I'm tired of seeing these tests label my kids a number and be used to, to fail uh, our kids. And I'd rather be reprimanded for standing up for what I believe in than just sitting back and letting this test run over us. And we took a vote, it was unanimous at Garfield High School, that we were going to refuse to administer this test. And right on. And we were, we were quickly met with a, a threat of a 10-day suspension without pay by the superintendent of the Seattle schools then. And it was then that I think the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life occurred, which is an entire faculty losing their fear. And that's something that I'd only heard about from my parents who were active in struggles against the Vietnam War or the Civil Rights Movement. But here I was seeing this faculty, every time they were threatened by the district, they were only more emboldened. And when national actions, literally thousands of letters came flooding into the Seattle schools and to Garfield High School in support of our struggle, uh, it just gave us the confidence to keep going. But then the one thing we did fear happened, which is the superintendent announced that if we weren't going to administer this test, he was going to have the administration come classroom by classroom, pull our students out, and march them off to the computer lab uh, to administer this test over our will. And the reason why this really worried us is because the lesson that people would draw all over the country is you can try to stand up to this high stakes testing regime, but in the end, they have all the power, they hold all the cards, and they're gonna figure out a way to get around it. And that's when I think this really became a social movement because at that point, you know, the PTA had voted unanimously to support our boycott, and the student body government had voted unanimously to support our boycott, but it had to move beyond a symbolic gesture. They had to actively join in the effort. And so the morning when the administration was supposed to pull kids out, our seniors, even seniors with the well-documented debilitating disease called senioritis in second semester, they got up early with a flyer and stood at their post at every door around the school, handing it out to the underclassmen, telling them, you don't have to take this exam. You, can, you have a right to refuse. And then when the administration came to the classrooms at Garfield High School and read off the names, those students staged a sit-in in their own classroom, refused to get up and take the test. And this really kicked off this whole season of resistance back in 2013 that many commentators came to call the education spring as we saw students lead walkouts just weeks after our declaration of resistance in, in Portland. And then it spread right here in Chicago where there was a mass walkout that year of students refusing to take high stakes exams. And then teachers in Chicago and New York began refusing. And we are, we are currently in the midst of the biggest uprising against high stakes testing in US history. We, absolutely, we have just 
word out in the last two days that in New York State, over 100,000 parents have opted their kids out of these exams, refusing to reduce them to a score. And it, it's spreading across the country. The largest walkout in U.S. history happened in Colorado earlier this year. And it's becoming a mass grassroots civil rights movement. And it's, it's, this is happening because there's a testocracy. There's a testocracy that produces these tests and profits directly off of them. Uh, and there's the wealthy billionaire foundations that have used their wealth to reduce the intellectual and emotional process of teaching and learning to a single number that they then want to use to punish students, parents, and teachers. They want to deny kids graduation. They want to bust up teachers' unions and, and fire teachers. Uh, and they want to label schools failing like they've done here in Chicago where they close scores of schools across the city. And I think that we're seeing more and more families of color and black families standing up in this civil rights tradition and reclaiming the history that the first testifiers in U.S. history were black radicals and intellectuals like the founder of the, uh, of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the most important black radicals whose early career focused on debunking the myths of these standardized intelligence tests that were being used to rank and sort the races. And we're seeing them used in a similar way today. And so that, I think, is what's driving this uprising against high-stakes testing around the country as people want to refuse to, to be reduced to a number and say that education has to have a much bigger purpose uh, than, than simply um, being reduced to a number and that we have to fight to reclaim our schools, parents, students, and teachers united. So thank, thank you. Thank you. And Jesse is the author of a new book, More Than a Score, The New Uprising Against High Stakes Testing. If you all haven't seen it, information. Uh, our next panelist is Valerie Ukapang. And Val, how does the model minority myth hurt not only Asian American and Pacific Islander students, but also black, Latino, and Native American students? And thank you for taking the mic. Thank you, Joyce. I, you speak right into it, yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm going to ask the gentleman that was helping me with the PowerPoint to put up the slides, DJ. Can we get the he slides? Does, he's not there. Oh, well, when he gets there, maybe he'll put some up. I want to ask you, why would anybody use a term like model minority? I'm a third generation Japanese American. My mother was put in the internment camp and she was taken away when she was 12 years old from Seattle to Hunt, Idaho in the middle of the desert, her whole family. But she was born in Seattle. So I think the model minority is just indicative. It's a symbol of how the dominant culture, the hegemony, takes over and shapes the thinking, frames the thinking for us. And I hope you, as teachers, educators, and people from the public, will help me to show and tell others that we need to get rid of that, the model minority. Because by just using the term minority, we're pay putting people, Asian, and Amer Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, as being less than, as second class, as outsiders. And then the model minority, model of what? I mean, they should have said, we're good role models. Or we appreciate your contributions, you're great students, you're great people in the community. Why do they have to use this term, model minority? So it's kind of like a way to frame it as being second class. There are many underlying beliefs about the model minority. First, one big one is all, all AAPIs, that's what I'm going to say instead of Asian American, Pacific Islanders, do well in school. Is that true? Do you know some students who don't do well? There's lots of them. And um, if you ever want to look at some of the data, my research team did a disaggregate of 13 Asian American Pacific Islander in the total population of California. It's in the Ed Researcher, December 2011. I have a few copies if you're interested. But we do know that there are huge dropout rates in the Asian American and Pacific Islander 
community. For example, 40% of Hmong, 38% of Lao, 35% of Cambodian. Then second, all AAPIs people think are well assimilated. Is that true? No. One third of all AAPIs have limited English proficiency. And I'm going to talk about that later. Then third, AAPIs, they don't need any services, do they? They're just doing so well, so they don't need anything. Uh, but if you look at the poverty rates of many Asian and Pacific Islanders, you will see they're very similar to a American Indian, African Americans, and Latinos. For example, 37% of Hmong, they are living in poverty, 29.3% Cambodian, 18.5% Lao, and 16.6% Vietnamese Americans. So that shows there is a great deal of need in the AAPI community. Change Next slide, slide, please. Next oh, slide. I don't know where the, thank you. I think the model minority can also be seen as a double-edged sword. It's kind of like a backhanded compliment. You're good, but don't get too good or we'll slice you up. You know, that's what I think. And, I mean, because they come up with these terms. Oh, they're so good, now we're going to call them outwhiting whites. That's really negative. It's not really celebrating what the kids do or what the people are doing, right? Some AAPIs are successful. However, the model minority lie does not acknowledge that they have had to fight extensive racism in schools and society. For example, did you know in 1882, Chinese immigrants were the first group named by ethnic background to be barred from coming into the United States, 1882. And then in 1927, the Lum family took their suit all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court when Martha Lum, their nine-year-old daughter, who, could, who was born in the United States, she's Chinese American, was not allowed to go to school because she wasn't white. Did you know that? There's a lot of you know, things that we, as a community, are linked. I want to tell you a little story, too, about I have three friends. They're Asian American professors at a Research One institution, they're in the same college, when they go to lunch at the faculty club together and they're sitting there, someone will come over sometimes and say, are you the yellow mafia? I mean, I'm asking you, how many people go up to three or four white professors and say, ask them if they're the white mafia? It's because Asian American Pacific Islanders are often looked at as foreigners, outsiders that they don't belong. The model minority is also a cultural exploitation because some people think, well, Asians should do more, right? They're community-minded, they're hardworking, they're responsible, so we'll give them the committee work. They should publish more, but they're not compensated more. They're not giving, given administrative positions. That kind of thing to me is very exploitive. Next slide. So um, I also want to talk about the cultural exploitation, how it impacts American Indians, African Americans, and Latinos, and other people of color, because it reinforces color-blind racism, where society is promoted as a meritocracy where anyone can succeed, even people of color, right? If you work hard enough and you follow the rules, the American dream is attainable. The myth says that Asian Americans are proof of that dream. So what's wrong with everybody else? Why can't they be like more, more like Asian Americans? However, they don't talk anything about the racism and all the problems that struggles that Asian American and Pacific Islanders have had to take care of along the way. And one of the things that really bothers me is that a lot of teachers believe that cultural values is why kids do well. You have values, don't you? 
Is it just your values that's going to make you successful? You come to ARA, you work hard. No, it's your persistence, your courage, your not giving up, all of that. It's not just certain cultural values. It could be your family values. It could be your neighborhood. It could be your mentor. It could be a million things. But there's so much in the literature about just, oh, they're Asian, it's their cultural values. Um, we must not turn our backs on other people. What does that say? Three minutes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to link with you some of the issues that people don't really think about with Asian American and Pacific Islanders. For if this is from Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and they have this wonderful chart and about voting rights. Asian Americans are the lowest voting of all the groups. If you would look there on the middle bar there, 59% of Latinos vote, 74% of whites, 73% African American, and the total population is 71%, but only 56% of Asian Pacific Islanders vote. If they're so smart and they're so wonderful and they're such a model minority, how come they're not voting? It's partly to do with language problems. As Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act, the United States or these states, our states, are supposed to provide translated materials, but they're finding that there's lack of translated ballots, translated registration forms, voter information brochures, and signs showing polling places, and there's a lack of bilingual polling people to help them. So these factors have led to poor participation of AAPI voters. Would you have thought that? I, I didn't think of that. And the second, and the second, um, one more. I had one more slide I wanted to show. Okay. Now, achievement, you don't usually think about Asian American Pacific Island needing achievement help, but if you look at that, that first gray top line is white Americans. And then you have Cambodians, Pacific Islanders, Hispanic, uh, Samoan, and African Americans on the bottom. So if you notice, there are lots of Asian groups who have very similar trends, and this is looking at the importance of parent education level. So you can see for uh, college, some college, the parents have some college, college, high school, or just some high school, that actually education works more for white kids than some of the other. So probably there's racism, low teacher expectations, and other lack of services for students of color, all of them, or many of them. So in closing, I want to say the model minority is a lie, and it creates divisions among communities. We must link our struggles for equity. We are more powerful together than alone. Thank you, Val. Our next panelist is Julian Vasquez Heilig. And Julian, I'd like to ask you to talk with us about this question. Are Latinos? and African Americans destined to be allies or rivals in educational policies such as school finance, choice testing, and standards. Thank you, Dr. King, President King. I'm Julian Vasquez Heilig. I'm from Cal State Sacramento. I'm a professor of educational leadership and policy studies, and I direct the doctorate in educational leadership there. Um, I also blog at Cloaking and Equity, which is a blog that focuses on education, public policy, and race. And you'll find a draft of my comments from this talk there. Please also tweet at me, at Professor JVH. Let me start by telling you a story about black and brown collaboration in Texas. When I first moved to Texas in 1999, I was heavily involved with grassroots politics with the Tejano Democrats. I also volunteered in the local district office of Congressman Sheila Jackson Lee and had worked on redistricting maps. When the Democratic Convention came around, it was suggested that I apply to be a delegate for the 2000 Democratic National Convention. 
As you probably know, the Democratic Party has quotas for the National Convention to ensure a diverse delegation based on a variety of categories, including youth, race, ethnicity, elected officials, etc. It was a day-long process that began with a questionnaire and concluded by giving a speech in front of the selection committee. By the end of the day, all the delegate slots had been filled except for one. The slot was reserved for a black male. The committee conferred and then asked how I could be eligible for a black delegate slot since I had checked Latino on the information sheet. I told them that Latino was an ethnicity and it was because there was no box for blacks again. The blacks and Latinos on the committee conferred. I was elected the final Texas delegate for the Los Angeles Convention. So my, my parents were first involved with the black Latino collaboration and now the committee had done so too. Is there a black and brown divide? Are they allies or foes? I as an academic could pontificate on whether I perceive or divide, but I thought it'd be more interesting for you to hear directly from Latino and black policymakers and representatives from civil rights organizations. Over the years, I've developed working relationships with Latino and African American policymakers in several states, so I reached out this week to them via text and Facebook. Four states, two of them having the largest population of Latinos, and two of them are Western states. Resoundingly, all of the policymakers and civil rights organizations' representatives said that Latinos and blacks are allies. However, as you will see, there are some challenges. A representative of a prominent civil rights organization commented, I definitely think we could be, are, question mark, allies. I think we share a lot of common objectives. An attorney for a prominent national Latino civil rights organization relayed, and I've backed out the names of the organizations and the states to protect, protect their uh, uh, identity. African American Civil Rights Organization and Latino Civil Rights Organization have testified together in our state many times in support of equalized school finance, more rigorous and college ready standards and preparation, against high stakes testing and vouchers. The same can be said of our national policies. A state level official from a prominent black civil rights organization commented, we are allies. I work with groups all the time in education policy. We work together and see eye to eye on these issues. The issues that affect Latinos have the same impact on black kids because we tend to be in the same neighborhoods, if not living in the same communities. There's always those who will try to stop the collaboration by reaching out to those who may not understand the issues but are willing to attempt to be the face of black and brown people. I could think of some folks right off the top of my head. <laughs> we tried stopping that from happening by staying active with our working relationships and building strong partnerships. Also by continuing to have a unified presence on these issues, especially when testifying. We, Latino and black civil rights organizations, agree on state choice, funding, testing, and standards. They may focus more on ELLs, understandably so, but we agree that what being defined as choice is wrong and isn't choice. National board member from a large civil rights organization uh, black Civil Rights Organization, I think allies in education. Now the critique is starting to begin. I have greater concern for divisions in some other areas. We have split with the Latino Civil Rights Organizations on redistricting, but have had a great ally there in another Latino Civil Rights Organization. Latino Civil Rights Organization also brought our state changes that were harmful to African Americans on school finance testing, but we've agreed on testing and choice. We've been quite united with them. A Latino Civil Rights Organization supported the parent trigger bill recently, but their lobbyist is a good guy and simply made a mistake. Our organization and the other Latino organization both opposed it. A Latino legislator said, I think we can be allies depending on the policy, is how the policy is written and strategy. This was perhaps borne out in the most stinging critique of the Brown-Black Alliance from a state level policy advisor. We always strive to be allies. They do until whites say choose. African Americans come to the table and bring Latinos who then contact the whites we had at the table for a side conversation for an alliance to make a deal. The policy advisor went through several examples of how interest in the community had diverged. They discussed how black legislators had supported due language approach in the state. It was the perspective of the policy advisor that the Latino legislators did a turnabout in the issue and pressed instead for bilingual because black kids had begun to benefit from the dual language approach. The policy advisor also mentioned that the Catholic lobby had been supportive of vouchers for their schools and was requesting that the Latino legislators support the voucher push. The policy advisor also posited that African Americans still sometimes lead the fight. We, as Latinos, don't need to do anything. Let the African Americans lead the fight, and then we will enjoy some spoils because the Republican leadership won't be mad at us because we did not fight them. Perhaps not every state is contentious as this one. 
a Latino legislator commented, based on the general positive experience I've had to edu with education advocates of color, at least in our state, we try to steer clear of the fighting for the crumbs and conquer and divide mentality. There's only one person in our state that I know of that tries to stir the Latino versus black pot and say that Latinos are getting more resources than black kids. But people know she's divisive and generally awful to work with. <laughs> In conclusion, our civil rights leaders laid the foundation for the Brown-Black Alliance. Arturo S. Rodriguez, president of the United Farm Workers, recently wrote, if there's one lesson we learned from Dr. King, it's that a struggle for civil rights is indivisible. Martin Luther King famously weighed in on the black, brown, and the fight for equality in his telegram to Cesar Chavez in September 1966. As brothers in the fight for equality, I extend the hand of fellowship and goodwill and wish continuing success to you and your members. You and your valiant fellow workers have demonstrated your commitment to righting grievous wrongs forced upon exploited people. We are together with you in spirit and in determination that our dreams for a better tomorrow will be realized, and I'll add, together. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. We're going to continue. I hope that you value the insights, the nuggets that we're getting. And our next panelist is Robert J. Miller. Professor Miller, could you uh, respond to this question? Why should minority groups push for a fuller, more nuanced, more inclusive teaching of United States history? Do you have any specific examples from your work or your research regarding American Indian law and history of how the U.S. does not teach full or nuanced true stories of history. Thank you very much, Dr. King, for having me here. I'm delighted to be up here. Um, I am a professor at the Arizona State uh, University College of Law, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State. I am a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma, and I'm the Chief Justice for the Grand Ronde Tribe uh, in Oregon. I'm extremely pleased to be able to speak on this topic and have really been driven home to me how excluded from history we are, folks. And this is an area where I think we really can link together and support each other to see that American history, and so I'm specifically speaking to the United States, I know people from other countries are here too, but the full, true history of our countries have to be told. In the United States, American Indians are just not included in most of the teaching of history, and I'm, I know that's the fact for most of the other, or all of the other minority groups in our country. But I wonder if even we ourselves know our own history, and if we have researched it and taught it to ourselves, so that then we know better how to include it in the classrooms and how to include it in our own knowledge base. I've been involved with four different efforts to really push Native Americans to the forefront uh, or at least to develop our own historical knowledge and to see that it's taught to the majority and also taught, of, of course, to ourselves. In 2003 to 2006, we, of course, celebrated in this country the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. The Lewis and Clark Bicentennial Commission was very interested to have tribal nations involved, and ultimately 41 American Indian tribal nations appointed official representatives to Lewis and Clark Bicentennial, and my tribe appointed me to that position. The tribes were not interested in celebrating Lewis and Clark, and they insisted that if they were going to be involved, that word had to be changed. And so the National Commission changed it to a commemoration. So it was the three-year commemoration of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And only then did tribes agree to get involved. And we didn't show up to talk about Lewis and Clark and what demigods they are. We showed up to tell our history. We are still here. Here's what Lewis and Clark and Manifest Destiny did to us, but as Alan said earlier, we are still here. We weren't wiped out. Don't forget us. And so I think it's extremely important for all our groups to, to work on our own history, research and write our own history. In those three years of the Lewis and Clark commemoration, I said this many times, we Native peoples have to research and write our own histories. We know in the academic field, if there's not a book on the shelf to pull off, it's like it doesn't exist. And so we have to see that it exists in the written text. Yes, Native American societies are oral societies, but if you want our history to be included in the United States history, we have to, to research that and write that. So out of the Lewis and Clark commemoration, I know of four books that came out, two by tribes, 
Tribes used federal grants to research and write their own stories. Research grants during the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial, and I know of Indian individuals that produced two other books about tribal peoples and their, <coughs> excuse me, uh, response, reaction, results from the Lewis and Clark expedition. So I hope to see that in, in, involved in many other areas. I've been involved with an effort in Montana to develop materials, <coughs> excuse me, uh, an effort to develop materials to include in the schools in Montana. And if you'd show the slide right now, I have just one slide. I was involved about three years ago in a, thank you. I was involved with a conference here at the Fields Museum, about four blocks from here it seems like, and a bunch of academic professors got together and had a conference on how to include truthfully and more fully in various genres of uh, the academic curriculum American Indians. I think this cover is just fantastic. You can't teach American Indian history without the people that are blotted out there, and that's how American history is taught today. Those people are blotted out and it's the same for all our groups. So how can we do something different? So my own tribe also right now got a grant from the federal government, and we have a three-year grant to, tr to study our history from 1812, the, the end of the War of 1812, to 1945. How did my tribe get removed from Ohio? How did we end up in the northeast corner of Oklahoma? So we're using federal resources, and a lot of our own scholars, now that there's a few Eastern Shawnee with de master's degree and myself in the law with a professional degree, we're working on our own history. So there's at least four efforts I've been involved in. What is taught about American Indians now in the schools? We're all dead. There's a 2015 dissertation that I was reviewing the other day that looked at the academic standards of all 50 states. 87 percent of the references to Indians are pre-1900. And the only way to get named as an Indian in these academic standards apparently is to have your name start with an S. Sacagawea, Squanto, Sequoia, or Sitting Bull. I'm gonna change my name to Steve or Sam or something. <laughs> it's the only way I'm gonna get into the history books. So that's what's taught. Indians were here. They were an obstacle to Euro-American uh, settlement. God wanted Euro-Americans to have everything. We made the phrase manifest destiny. That's exactly what it really, really meant. And Indians are somehow magically gone. And that's just ridiculous, but that's the situation we're at. Can we force the teaching of, I'm focusing just on American Indian issues, can we force the teaching of American Indian history and culture in uh, the schools? To my knowledge, there are five states that have enacted statutes, but they're not mandatory. Uh, I know that Washington, Montana, and I think South Dakota, and I forget the other two states, have passed statutes in the last decade encouraging the teaching of American Indian history and government and culture in the grade school and high school curricula. Montana even incorporated a provision in its constitutional amendment in 1972. But it, to my reading, it's not mandatory, although the Montana Supreme Court has twice read it as being a mandatory provision and Montana passed a law in 2005 to fund the teaching of Indian history and culture in their schools. That's one of the efforts I was involved with in Montana, but it still hasn't happened. Kind of hard to force schools to change their curriculum. Can't, as Dr. King and I talked, hard to get Texas and California to change those uh, standardized uh, text case books. So it, it is our statutes the way to go? Or is it, you know, is it on ourselves? I mean, I keep saying we have to produce the material and then we have to try to get it in the school if we can get state legislators to help, fantastic. In Washington, very interestingly, there is a statute pending in front of the legislature now to make the 2005 Washington law mandatory. And it's interesting that it's been uh, offered by a Native American state senator. We're only 1% of the population. We have less than 1% of the legislators. <laughs> but we're going to have to try to do something. So I see I have three minutes to go, so now let me talk about what I've been working on since the, I was appointed to the Lewis and Clark uh, commemoration. I want to wonder, how many of you have ever even heard of the phrase, the doctrine of discovery? It's the international law of colonialism, and it applies to every one of us. But yet, is it taught in our schools? And then more specifically, is it taught about American Indians? How were we displaced from the occupation, use, and ownership of this continent? 
Well, it was done under international law. In fact, the doctrine of discovery is among the earliest international laws. If you come to my school and take Indian law, property law, and international law, you will hear and learn about the doctrine of discovery. I bet few Americans know anything about it. I've written two books on it, so if you want to you know, support me, buy my book. <laughs> All European countries used this doctrine of discovery to claim and colonize the entire rest of the world. It sprang from papal bulls in 1436 about the Canary Islands, papal bulls in 1452, 53, and 55 about the west coast of Africa, and then finally when Columbus stumbled on the New World in the Caribbean, Pope Alexander VI divided the world in half in four papal bulls in 1493. These are still papal bulls, you know, authority of the Catholic Church to this day. Many people have asked for the Vatican to withdraw these papal bulls that literally ordered Europeans to kill, conquer, control, take all the property of anyone that wasn't a Christian. I have one minute, oh, one minute to talk about a thousand years of European history, of European, our history. Thank you very much, Sharon. Well, I'll wrap up as quick as I can, but all the European countries adopted the doctrine of discovery. The line that was drawn from the Pope gave Portugal Africa and Asia and gave Spain most of the Americas and most of the Pacific. And that line was of great significance. England, France, and Holland adopted this thinking, the idea that was based on Christianity and civilization, made Europeans superior to the rest of the world. And in my book, I argue that that doctrine of discovery became American Manifest Destiny. And in fact, as the earlier speaker mentioned, what was Captain Cook doing in New Zealand? What was he doing in Australia? And do any of you know he landed in Alaska three times, planted the English flag, and claimed Alaska for England? So he was using this international law as he was ordered by the admiralty to do, to make these claims. What do we know about that? What do we teach about that? How did Euro-Americans and then the United States claim superiority of sovereignty and property ownership over the United States? The Doctrine of Discovery, folks, was enacted in our Constitution, the laws of every one of our English colonies, all of our American states, and ultimately the executive branch, the legislative branch, and then the United States Supreme Court adopted the doctrine in 1823 in the case of Johnson v. McIntosh. Some of you might know that case. It's cited 30 or 40 times in New Zealand, 50 or 60 times in Canada. Uh, it's cited in Australia about 40 or 50 times, and even by the English Privy Council about cases out of Africa. This international law doctrine of discovery ultimately led to the attempted domination and actual domination of all of us. So we have a lot of work to do. We can't count on anyone else to do it but ourselves. Thank you, right. Professor Miller. I hope you can see the value of this conversation across communities. Uh, Susan Goodwin, Dr. Goodwin, would you please respond to this question? Education has always been perceived by communities of color as the answer to oppression and the inequitable conditions that seem to continually characterize our reality. How do you understand the apparent failure of K-12 education to make a significant difference in the lives of growing numbers of children of African heritage as well as other peoples of color and their communities? And don't forget to tell us who you are. I'm Susan Goodwin, and I'm director of the Rochester Microphone. Teacher Center, and I'm also a teacher union leader. I am tempted by the comments uh, made to um, change my own comments, but I'm going to resist. I'll only say that they did put a flag on the moon. <laughs> I'm going to speed, so please um, be patient with me. As we experienced in yesterday evening's uh, presidential session, education for people of African heritage, indigenous Americans, and other people of color is highly valued and seen as a responsibility. It is part of an ancestral conversation, an intergenerational communication where essential knowing has been identified and passed on to those that follow. It's an ancient blueprint for how to be and how to live. Essentially, our ancestral message has been interrupted. For the most part, community leaders, activists, legislators, so-called progressives, and even most educators have looked upon schooling and education as something that, yes, we must have, 
but primarily the focus has been on attaining equity in terms of facilities, materials, funding, rights, even course opportunities, and high quality experienced teachers. Advocates and researchers for improvement have supported concepts like heterogeneous grouping of students, pre-K, emphasis on reading, small schools, active learning, inclusion of special education students, authentic assessments, and other constructive instructional approaches, with one or two at various times having been deemed the answer to educating the underserved. Yes, even after all of these research-based solutions to what is typically termed the underachievement of children of color, there is one place that for the most part continuously remains virtually invisible, outside of any serious consideration or contemplation, and that is curriculum. So why has education, and here we need to be specific, why has Western education not been a liberating force for the majority of people of color? History, reason, and logic require us to ask, is it meant to be? How and why does curriculum, the heart of all instruction, fail to, under, fail to understand, uh, fail to be understood as the driver for teaching and learning? Curriculum content and instructional approaches are intrinsically linked to consciousness. Ways of being and doing are preceded by consciousness. Where are the instructional models for right action, right relationship, and right living to come from, if not from school curriculum? Where does following the lead of Western education take us, all of us? K-12 curriculum as it exists represents the thinking, worldview, goals, and objectives of its designers. Why and how does curriculum and its corresponding instructional approaches continue to be ignored as the answer, as well as the solution, to the problems associated with unsatisfactory student outcomes. Curriculum is linked to, either by supporting or limiting, self-knowledge, identity development, thinking, whether logic, reasoning, analytical, or creative, deductive, inductive, or common sense. Some questions and some examples that I would offer. How do you think that a society learns to accept concepts like power over, colonialism, manifest destiny, sexism, racism, supremacy, the higher worth of some, scarcity, and hostility toward nature? Why do these ideas seem to exist in a package? These assumptions or organizing concepts have been learned, therefore they have been taught. Further, we find that all of these ideas and behaviors are embedded in Eurocentric school curriculum, content, practices, and policies, and they are even presented as inevitable. Universal thoughts. Education curriculum is a transmitter of culture. Even if the narrator, the voice in our own instructional experiences, suggests that it is neutral. In elementary schools, students are taught to read using materials, texts, and images that consistently feature some as superior and more important than others. When you learn to read, whether the alphabet, phonics, decoding, or grammar, you simultaneously learn the ideas and values that are embedded in the text. The voice in the text and curriculum consistently disconnects people of color from their places of origin, and from each other. In fifth grade, developmentally inappropriate Common Core Science curriculum, children learn about disease before they learn about health. This and other ideas like scarcity, survival of the fittest, and unworthiness are Eurocentric cultural concepts that serve to engender fear, and outsider status at an early age, and these are reinforced until, until children drop out, are forced out, or graduate. Thinking critically is not possible without enough content knowledge. When knowledge and information remain concealed or hidden, long-standing patterns and cycles remain unobservable, whether in science or history. Predictions are groundless. 
We experienced the numbing of students and the dumbing down of a whole society. Typically, and in fact, we do not learn history, ours or anyone else's. Essentially, what we learn is myth. And I don't mean myth in the real sense. Recently, we find that Egypt and its anterior civilization has been removed from New York State Social Studies curriculum. Responding to the educational needs of children of African heritage requires an African cultural center as a foundation for all other learning. Relational knowing, mentoring, eldering, each of these pedagogies teaches care, love, the idea of a collective humanity that prepares one for problem solving, whether mathematical, social, or biological. In fact, most problems deemed inevitable by Western instructional constructs need not be expected to arise. For example, when intrinsic motivation is understood and incorporated into instructional approaches, disciplining children is inherently connected to self-regulation. Misbehavior is met with instruction and reparations, not punishment. Parents, families, and the community are connected to the instructional program. They serve as audiences and as, an evalu as evaluators of students' work. Question-driven pedagogy in African and indigenous American instructional approaches uh, by which knowledge, meaning mating, intellect, I'm sorry, meaning making, intellect, empathy, self-regulation, and agency are developed and actualized. Cultural precepts, the principles of Kwanzaa, are visible in instructional approaches, expectations, and authentic assessments of student work and ways of being. For example, unity, umoja, is seen in group teaching, learning, presentations of knowledge, cooperative learning is real. Student, students' peer groups are seen as sources of support, positive reinforcement, courage building, and strength. Um, this approach, I should say the African-centered paradigm, reflects a totally different curricular framework from that in which most of us have been drenched. Need we wonder why so many are just now learning and experiencing the consequences of Eurocentric thinking? Why we find ourselves feeling powerless when in actuality we are not? Why we allow division when in actuality we are all connected? People, plants, animals, the elements, planets, and galaxies. Why do we seem to think there are no consequences for destruction and wrong action? Most importantly, why is our mind unable to use our brain? It has been split by illogical, unethical ways of being and thinking, fear and self-negation, and by the violations to which we have been party. So here we live in a democracy where the majority rule, yet the 1% run our lives in our schools. And our schools, further, we have no problem describing urban schools as having majority minority populations. Really, I maintain that we, educators and our students, have learned with some of us totally ingesting what was fed to us through curriculum and instructional methods. As researchers and educators, we can and we should review the curriculum to see exactly what we have ingested and internalized as being real and acceptable so that we can expel it. As a veteran secondary teacher and a professional developer, I know without doubt that it is in the unacknowledged ancient curricular frameworks of African and indigenous peoples and through educators who reclaim them or learn them that we find the way out and the way forward. Thank you, Susan. Our next panelist is Curtis Acosta. Curtis, your questions are, what was the pedagogical approach of the Mexican-American studies program in Tucson to build a sense of solidarity and community among students of different ethnicities and culture? 
And during the process of banning the MASS program, how did the state view and represent the work of your students, colleagues, and community? And where do things stand now? Well, uh, thank you, Dr. King, uh, for this. Uh, it's an honor to be on such an esteemed panel. And uh, thank you, AERA. And, uh, Forgive my ignorance, but um, does anybody, I'm hoping somebody, I'm, I'm not putting anyone on the spot here, but I'm so hoping somebody knows whose ancestral land and whose land this is right now. Can anyone, does anybody know? Yes. Potawatomi. The, I'm sorry, one more time. Potawatomi. Potawatomi? Yes. So I'd like to thank the Potawatomi people for allowing me to be a guest here today. Um, You know, settler colonialism, that, that project is, uh, is one that uh, does some mighty things to your brain and to your mind and who you are as a person. Um, for us in uh, Mexican-American studies, oh, I should say, my name is Curtis Acosta. <laughs> I'm a former Mexican-American studies teacher in Tucson before our program was taken over by the state and it was banned through legislation. Um, I'm also uh, now uh, a displaced teacher, <laughs> so, uh, um, so uh, I, I've started my own consulting uh, firm, Costa Latino Learning Partnership, and also I'm an advisory board member for the uh, Education for Liberation Network. And uh, as I was mentioning before, the trauma that comes from this col colonial uh, settler uh, project is uh, we all felt, my collective uh, as uh, Mexican-American studies teachers and our students, we saw what happened to us, losing our identity, um, being, being, you know, uh, feeling, a, a, living an internalized, oppressed life, hating myself as a Mexican. I, I'm biracial, and that was uh, that was some project too. <laughs> um, you know, there, the, back in the day, uh, we were uh, halfies and mixed. I mean, that was a nice, a nice fra uh, phrase for us. Um, alienated often by 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 many. Um, so uh, for, my, for my colleagues, uh, they had similar trauma. Um, I'm self-identifying Chicano. It's who I am. It's how I feel. It's, it's, uh, the term Chicano itself is, is, uh, is, is a, a callback to our indigenous roots on this tierra, uh, in these Americas. And so um, we didn't want our students to go through that. Um, we've heard from so many of these stories today how, what that does to us. We see it in all these horrible negative outcomes, and we have for generations. You know, it, it drives me crazy if I may just do a little digression. It, you know, Jesse brought up how, you know, how reductive things are with high-stakes testing. Um, we, uh, let me fast forward. We, we had amazing data for our program, and yet data doesn't matter when it's about liberation. Data doesn't matter when it's about seeing yourself as a full human being when you're talking about young uh, black and brown uh, and, and uh, Asian students. You just, it's just not happening. Um, it, it's a convenient myth, uh, much like these historical myths that we're, the myths that are taken as history. Um, so what, what we wanted to do was, was uh, decolonize that space and, uh, and through love. And through indigenous epistemologies that we knew uh, from our elders that are in the codices and in the very ground, this, this, this earth, uh, this Western, uh, we, we call it, you know, I always do a little joke, well, West Side, West Side knowledge, Western Hemisphere. You know, we got our own knowledge. And uh, in our West Side knowledge, there's beautiful ideals, such as the ideal of in La Quesh, or Tu Eres Mi Otro Yo, or the, the ideals in the Nahuilin, the center of the Aztec uh, calendar. And we used those uh, and operationalized those teachings from our elders and, and turned it into a pedagogy. And, and our space became one of liberation. And our students were far more, far more uh, decolonized and liberated than we ever could be. And, and they, they, would, they would tell us. <laughs> they would hold us accountable to when we would fall back into those, those patterns. Um, and that was for everybody, you know, something that we, was brought up earlier about, uh, you know, the, the trauma that we go through as people of color on this, uh, on this continent. But, you know, when you're the oppressor, that's traumatic, too. Um, so we had, you know, you know our, our courses were open to everyone. And we had many of our students who were of European descent, and, and they hate that burden, right? 
uh, they're young people that want to be loved and want to love equally. And then, but what happens through this machine of privilege, this m- machine of, 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 of uh, uh, white supremacy is, you know, you get stuff. And once you get stuff and positions, then all of a sudden your, your, just, your, your will for justice, your will to act, your will to act is tested. And so what, what was beautiful about our spaces was the fact that, that collectively we could love each other and find our common humanity in a critical way, not in a colorblind way. That's an, un, that's an uncritical way. It's an ahistorical, uh, uh, anti-intellectual way. We could see each other in our intersectionalities and love each other. We could hear each other's pain. We could empathize with one another and then get busy on the work. Get busy, like the Huitzilopochtli means the will to act. Work together to transform this society. And when you do that, you get banned. When you do that, you get, you get actual legislation by a state to stop that project, that liberating project, that project in democracy. Um, and that, that was fascinating. You know, one of the things, listening to, to my colleagues today, we taught so much of the history that they're bringing to our attention that some of us probably in this room didn't even know. I didn't know until I was with my collective and we dug deeper and deeper into the Chinese Exclusionary Act and to the, to the doctrine of, uh, of discovery. Uh, our students knew that. That was their content. And when you get that content, you can see things clearly. You can see the link in our struggle. And it was really going back, like I said, to that in those indigenous ways that really made us reaffirmed who we were, right? Instead of like seeing ourselves as, 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 uh, as adversaries or having to struggle, as, as, as Julian said, with some, uh, quoting some of his, his colleagues, or not his colleagues, but some of the folks that he uh, asked to, to contribute to his talk, um, seeing each other as rivals fighting for the crumbs, we could see each other as full human beings and work together. And that, that was, that's a beautiful thing. Now, how, the, how they came at us, though, rhetorically is, as foreigners, I think uh, Val brought that up, you know, exoticizing us, especially the fact that we found our indigenous heritage on this land. Oh, and that scares, let me tell you, that scares folks of color, too, who, are, who haven't been liberated and are still colonized. Because... You know, we, were, we, 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 don't, we didn't have that opportunity to hear this history. We didn't have the opportunity to know where we really came from and to, 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 to embrace ourselves and our humanity um, and to know who we are. And so when, when there are black and brown folks out in the community and they see the weiwei, they see the drumming, and they see the danza azteca, they, they start going, whoa, no, that's, that's evil. You know, that's, uh, that's kind of cultish. In fact, uh, we were accused of, of, of cult-like techniques by saying uh, a poem together. In La Quesh, tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. And we were, you know, like they were chanting together. <laughs> they were clapping and chanting. The, you know, the United Farm Worker Club, that was chanting and clapping in a mysterious way. Our use of the uh, terms of endearment, mija and mijo, were, put, were, in, were in, are in, are codified in, in the Arizona State uh, records as being something that's unprofessional, that crosses the line that you shouldn't be doing that because now you're creating this bond that is, in, that, is, that is disturbing, that's not like what you should be as a teacher. You know, and the last thing I guess I, I'll, I'll say to, to, to wrap this up is, is, is that's how they always come at us. We come, they, they, they label us as radicals. They label us, us as others. They, they come at, a, at us with an anti-historical lens. This, whose land really is this? We are guests here, and we need to make sure that we are in a democratic project that calls to that, that restores that, that repairs that. That this was a nation built on slave labor, on stolen land, and the pain exists daily for those folks. But we have the power within ourselves to heal that. And... uh, and no matter what they say about, uh, to us then, if we, if we walk with each other and we walk in beauty and we walk in light and we walk together, it, it, it's just words. It's our actions together that will, sell, that will, that will lay our foundation and our legacy for our children.
you, Curtis. Curtis has reminded us that the they is sometimes in us. So this is not a we, they discussion, but it is looking at where is the source of our common problem. I would like to invite uh, Cerisi Westo Latunji to now talk about ethical standards that are in place. Are ethical standards in place to hold educational practitioners and researchers accountable for their practices? However, when educators fail to respond to the unique needs of culturally marginalized students, what legal actions can be taken to enforce humanistic practices and acceptable outcomes for these students and their families? Thank you, Joyce, and I um, want to uh, tell you I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of this panel, so I appreciate the space that ARA and you as president have offered. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is introduce myself just a little bit. Um, my name is Cerisi West Olatunji, and I'm a faculty member at the University of Cincinnati in counselor education, and I'm also director of the Center for Traumatic Stress Research. And this work has really been the entirety of my professional career in the academy, starting with my dissertation. That really comes from my own experience of just living in this world and wondering why is it that when something happens, uh, when you know somebody is you know out now drug addict, when they've gone to prison, they've committed suicide or whatever, I'm always looking and thinking, why that brother? I mean, because this one was really smart. This brother had so much to offer, and I was always asking that question, why, why, why is it, why that one right there? And so that had always been pressing for me to try to understand that. And so I began investigating that with my dissertation that was asking the question about whether or not racism was a correlate for post-traumatic stress disorder amongst our children. And I've been doing that work ever since to try to understand this and also to be able to offer solutions. To me, the issue of ethics is a clear one because we talk about ethical concerns and we have disciplinary actions for ethics in just about every other area, except to talk about what's happening to our children in the classroom. And that's where it's critical, it's most critical to be able to do that. So I think we need to have a mechanism to remove people, to punish people, to find some kind of remediation for people, um, and we need a way to be able to recognize that. So my work has been to identify very specific and scientifically exactly what is driving our children mad and to also document ways in which they are resistant in very healthy ways. So it's really the opposite. The kids that we're saying who are compliant and they're, and they're saying they're wonderful children really are out of their minds. And the children that they're saying are crazy are as sane as can be. Okay, so that seems to make sense, right? But we need to do the work to give people the language to be able to talk about that. If you were at the, the youth tribunal this morning, you would have seen children who have the language to charge genocide. And they would put any, any scholar here at this conference to shame. They were able to speak our language, to talk about their lived experience, and to tell us what's wrong with it. So they're, they're in their right minds. So that's not really my language. Actually, I get that from Amos Wilson, uh, the late Amos Wilson, who talked about how our children are being driven out of their African minds. Uh, and, it, and then he followed that up with talking about unlocking the brilliance of our children's minds. And that, that is the work that we need to do. And we need to hold other people accountable for that. Um, and so anybody, regardless of their cultural background, uh, whether they're, you know, within the center or in the margins, everybody needs to be responsible for that when we're working with our children. And I use a phrase in thinking about where are we going with this. So I always use the concept of trauma and resilience always together. Never, never one or the other, but together, because those things exist in a diunital fashion. We always have that trauma, we always have the resilience. 
and that story needs to be told. So I talk about ore ire, which is a Yoruba term to talk about realigning African heads. So any, any pedagogy that we use, any intervention that we use, any time we're talking about what the problem is, we automatically have to talk about what the solution is and talking about ore ire and realigning our heads. And that's important when we take a look at um, children and their acts of resistance. We talk about how have people tried to survive, how have people survived despite what it is that they're experiencing. So, you know, I just want to give a, a couple of examples of that that I use in my training of healers who are responsible, who are responsible for these heads, for these minds, for these souls. So one is the myth about for instance, black male, female relationships. And I, when I was in private practice, I used to do a lot of black male, female relationship seminars. And I used to start small. And eventually, I started doing large halls like this because people wanted to be able to talk about this within the context of their oppression. So not, not just what is in the textbooks, but in the context of their oppression to be able to talk about that. But I would start with this idea of the myth so they talk about during slavery that you know our relationships were broken down and we didn't have that. That's not true. So you have to be able to read the archival information that tells us about the beauty of these relationships and the length that people would go to to hear love stories during slavery where people would work from sunup to sundown, sneak away off the plantation just to see their loved one and then sneak back on the plantation. That took all night to do that without getting caught. So that's 24 hours, right? Just to be able to show love is important and the development of relationships, a sense of community and so on. So we have to be able to teach other people how to tell this story and to be responsible for that. So I asked the question, um, so I'm sure that you've heard a lot during the conference about, you know, why do we need to hold people accountable for these ethical <coughs> breaches, I call them. And you've heard about that in terms of, um, you know, over um, uh, representation in special education, under representation and gifted, um, but also issues around how are we being diagnosed with learning disabilities, with cognitive deficits of be, a be, with diagnoses early on that are, are not even listed. Um, so they have to change the DSM to include more of us. And that's most recently been done so that they can include more of our students as being pathological. So this idea of who's pathological, are we pathological or are the oppressors pathological? So now we're talking about needing researchers to step up to the table of needing uh, our mental health professionals and healers to step up to the table to provide us with the information that's needed uh, to be able to talk about the pathology of the oppressor. So that's not in the DSM, that, that's not in there. And that's what we need to do. So back in the 1970s, Carl Bell, actually from here in Chicago, a, a psychiatrist, uh, wrote an article about the nar a racism as a narcissistic personality disorder. A lot of people don't know about that. But what we need to do is to begin systematically documenting what's being done as pathological and then to be able to charge people with ethical breaches when they're teaching our children. Very much. So our next uh, panelist is Congressman Mike Honda, and I'm just going to take a minute to ask the people who are scattered way in the back to come up front, uh, come closer, so that we can have some sense of a community here. I know you like to be where you can sneak out, but we want to see you if you sneak out. So please take a minute to just come up. We have four more panelists. Congressman Honda is going to speak briefly right now. Thank you very much. See, she's doing a great job. Come on, some of you others. Thank you. Uh, Congress Congressman Honda is going to speak right now as part of the panel. And then he's offered 
he will stay longer for a longer conversation and we'll certainly uh, take a break so that people who have to go will be able to go. This is just a brief uh, introduction to remarks that he'll amplify um, at the end of this panel. Congressman Honda, we're so appreciative that you could take time to come here. And I'm going to share just a second. He and I used to work together when he didn't have any gray hair, and I had a lot more hair. <laughs> and I call her queen. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm glad you brought him on in because this is not church. You know? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, come on to the front and... Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I can understand. I like to sit in the back so I can slip out to the bathroom. So the uh, the question was, uh, tell us about the U.S. Department's Education's Equity and Excellence Commission, what it was, what it did, and how I was involved. First, I want to say uh, to the members of the panel and to the audience, this has been a wonderful collection of thoughts and experiences and study and uh, really um, progressive um, work to make sure that we make sure that our youngsters that we care about will get the best that they uh, should deserve in a country like ours. So, um, and it's very productive to bring these perspectives together because uh, we can get a more holistic understanding of the educational problems we face in this country. It's like ecology. When we first taught ecology, we talked about the food chain. Then later on, we talked about the food web which means that if you pull one side or another side, it affects everything else. So we're now moving into a, a section where we start to understand all of us are linked together, both in our histories, our, our culture, our uh, advancements, and the kind of work that we're trying to do uh, for our children in this country. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the educational problem that has come to define my time in Congress and I call that educational inequity. It's no secret that our students have very different experiences and experiences that are often a function of where they're born or their zip code, but we understand that that is one of the very uh, nub of a lot of the problems that we face with uh, addressing our youngsters' needs in education. I see that problem in front and center in my own home, District of Silicon Valley. Uh, children are a of affluent college-educated parents with high-tech jobs or CEO parents receive great educations in places like Palo Alto and Cupertino. But a few miles away, children of parents who are non-native speakers live in poverty, live in the wrong zip code uh, because they lack the resources they need, not only personally but also in schools. And the status quo, as is evident here, is unacceptable. Each and every child has a civil right to an excellent education. But then how do we move forward? In 2010, I used my role as an appropriator to initiate funding for Department of Education's Equity and Excellence Commission. It was a commission that was formed through an effort of mine uh, to start a bill to address uh, educational equity for each and every child and moving away from the term all children have a right to an equal opportunity. I want it to be more specific and more focused. So the commission brought together 28 leaders and thinkers from very different sectors of our society to explore the problem of educational inequity and propose solutions to moving towards equity and education for each and every child. And the commissioners were not of single mind often having divergent opinions and per, uh, perspectives, such as Linda Darling-Hammond, Eric Hanushek, John B. King, Randy Weingarten, uh, Chris Edley, uh, Tino uh, Cuellar. They all worked together as part of the commission, and building consensus was difficult. I often had to remind commissioners to put aside their own biases and focus on the needs of each child, using that as a guiding and binding principle for their work because they all had golden nuggets in their own professional uh, work that they're very proud of. And then in, among the 28, they had to put it all on the table and have it challenged and work together to find that binding principle. How do we approach equity for each and every child? The co-chairs did a masterful job, and I called them the arsonist and the firefighter. <laughs> 
They started fires in the discussion, they worked through the problem, and then one of the other co-chairs sort of found a way to bring them to some sort of cohesion. And I thought this was going to take 18 months, but it took over 22 months. That's about the gestation time of a whale. <laughs> the commission came to an agreement, creating a landmark report called For Each and Every Child, a Strategy for Education, Equity, and Excellence. And the report lays out a series of bold recommendations for addressing educational inequity. And you can find that in, in my uh, website. And uh, I would ask you to look at it, read it, and then make some comments to us. Now, where do I go from here with that com uh, commission report? A couple of things. Um, since the report's released, I worked with my colleagues in Congress to bring some the commission reports to life. And one of them is uh, sponsoring a bill that offers grants to school districts, not to state, but school districts, so that they can use their own funding and ask for more funding so that they can create a funding situation in their schools so that they can apply equitable funding for each child's needs in the schools. Theoretically, the concept and the principle of equity for each and every child stems from the idea that each child is different, each child is different. They start at school differently, they're not their equal footing, and yet we begin schooling as if they were all starting the same. <laughs> right there, we have a problem. And so, the, this legislation is just asking the school districts to start to look at funding based upon each child's needs, and therefore each child's gonna have different funding levels, right? And if they have each funding level different, then that's equity. Mm -hmm. ADA is based upon average daily attendance. Same amount of money per child per day. And that's how we fund our schools. That's equality, that's parity, mm -hmm. that's not equity. Mm -hmm. And so the concept, the driving principle of this whole idea is equity in education for each and every child. And so every solution that we look at has to be driven by this principle, no matter what. Now, if we do this, just think of the um, change that we could ex experience. But if we do this also, we know that it's going to be difficult. We know it's going to be hard. We know there's going to be a lack of resources, lack of human resources. It's going to cost a lot of money. Well, I submit to you, how much did it cost to go to Iran hmm. and Afghanistan without a tax base? Without a tax base. So um, I want to take the, the comments of every person here afterwards and sort of weave them together to form that blanket, that tapestry, this thing that we're calling equity for these children because every one of them has a key element in the defining of what this blanket could look like for each and every child. Model minority, right on, Asian American. She said it, everybody understood it, but there's one more thing that has happened with youngsters who are stereotyped this way. They internalize that. Mm -hmm. When you internalize that, then you start oppressing other people. You internalize that, you oppress yourself because you start to think you are better than others. You remember how teachers used to say, and I was a principal of a school, I used to hear teachers say, oh, I got 60% of Asian kids in my class next year. Oh, boy. And I said to the, to the group, what impact does that have with other teachers? What impact does that have with other children who hear that? And what impact does that have to children who are subject to the model minority? Kids who cannot perform, who are Asian Americans, become quiet and they disappear. Happens in colleges, high schools. And so any kind of stereotype really becomes very negative. And as I said, it has some positive aspects, but, but the, the negative overrides the, the negative possibility. And let me close with this and then I'll wait till later on. This, 
this matter of this uh, discovery, this uh, the doctrine of discovery, really makes you think about the movement and the de development of this country. And I hope to have a uh, slide up there that shows the progressive, the progress of from before 1600 to today, and how the history un un unfolded. And then we have to look at that history in place. Where did education start? Where is the genesis of public education? It's all over the place. There is no one genesis for public education. So when you look at that history, you start to see, you know, where uh, pri uh, property tax started to drive things and it still hasn't changed. Where agriculture is still driving the time that we spend for the school year. And then now we say time on task. Let me suggest, and I'll close with this. Time is the currency that each child has to go to school with. They come to school, they spend it, and that's it. Now, if we don't use that currency appropriately, the return on that investment of that child and that parent can be great or none. The kids will get none. The question is, do they have the equal protection of our Constitution? Because all children should have the right to an equal education. And then the final analysis is this. Compulsory education came up along the history of our country. Why, when, and its impact has to be asked. Because if kids don't get what they need in the 10 years they're required to be in school, that's almost like a determinant sentence. And so I, I'd love to uh, continue this discussion later. Thank, Thank you very much. The congressman is going to come back. Our uh, next panelist is Iva E. Carruthers. Um, and would you please comment on uh, this observation? Historically, research uh, and points of view grounded in various relational aspects of studies of race, human behavior, and genetics have foundational to education research and pedagogy. Your professional journey as a sociologist, educational technologist, and theologian provides a unique lens of analysis through which to critique today's research in areas such as the school to prison pipeline, genomics of violence, implicit bias, and cognitive enhancement. What is the content of today's underbrush around race, human behavior, and biogenetics? that is informing and impacting educational policy and practice and the lived experience and future of our children and communities. Thank you, Dr. King. And to my co-panelists and to all of you there, I appreciate this opportunity to share in this phenomenal conversation. I am privileged to serve as the General Secretary of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, which is a not-for-profit NGO a faith and spirit-led justice advocacy organization. I am also recently appointed to the National African American Reparations Commission, and I chair the Kwame Nkrumah Academy, which made me so proud this morning as they participated in uh, the tribunal that you had envisioned for our young people. Uh, I want to say to Dr. Graham that I was most inspired and renewed by his reminder, which is really the sum of my comments, that colonialism is alive and well, and what we have to attend to are the new forms of its expression and attend to the possibility of a 360-degree um, understanding and penetration of that. So as we think more strategically about linking our struggles and epistemological annihilation or annihilation, as you pointed out yesterday, and its many tributaries, it is critical that we unapologetically interrogate the ongoing convergence of race, human behavior, and genetic studies as a significant, if not the significant, underbrush of what we see as policy and practices related to educational policy, pedagogy, and community nation development. The convergence of race, human behavior, and genetic studies as this underbrush is not new. What is new is the capacity to impose irreparable harm upon our basic human traits, spirit, and will, 
What is new is the intensity of the global competitive environment that will determine choices made by a few that will impact the many. What is new is the threat posed by the real possibility of actualizing the linking of our struggles. This epistemological underbrush is what gives meaning and shape to the system of control and oppression that allows for Euro-American Western hegemony and values to dominate the world order. And at its base is the definition of an understanding of what is normative behavior and what it fundamentally means to be human. Quickly, I want to describe three major benchmarks of this convergence and example them as it relates to educational research and practice, bringing for our attention to where we are now. The first is the obvious one characterized by a purely phenotypic approach to race, dehumanizing African humanity, attempting to annihilate African culture, and stealing African intellectual capital. That period was grounded in the principle of no education for Africans, eventually giving in to the policy to weaken our resistance to enslavement through religious training and or to train intermediaries between African masses and the inferior. Quote, from the great European debate between John Stuart Mill and um, um, Carlisle, John Carlisle, the nigger question and the Negro question, um, to the American founding of gynecology by James Marion Sims of South Carolina, by which enslaved African women were e inhumanely and horrifically experimented on to serve the needs of a system of control. Case studies to be example then was the life story of Phyllis Wheatley, uh, shepherded around the world as the exceptional one, the biography of Frederick Douglass who talked about the anger in response to his um, master being able to see him read the newspaper. The second phase was characterized by the definition of eugenics with attendant researches on educational policy as a science to prove our inferiority. This period included the era of the women's movement and Tuskegee syphilis experimentation, evidencing blatant assumptions of racial hierarchy and the devaluing of African American men and their families, epitomized by the U.S. Health Services 1942-72 30-year experiment on syphilis. It led up to the era of the post-Cold War, evidencing a racial cultural fear in U.S. national and global demographic and political shifts, epitomized by the view of demographers such as Wattenberg. Um, this post-civil rights movement era was the period in which the researchers of those such as Moynihan Report on the Black Family, Arthur Jensen, Banfield, Christopher Jinks, Diane Ravitch, and major issues of the bell curve, Ebonics, and African-centered education, on and on and on, were permanent in our resistance. We took all of that on and began a strong African-centered education movement that ushered in a real paradigm shift and self-determinant research for which there is no turning back, otherwise we wouldn't be here. It was during this period that the convergence of race, human behavior, and genetics yielded researches around melanin studies from phenotype to genotype, impacting views on eye-hand motor skills, death perception, ability to cross the midline, sports acumen, health, physiological, and cellular racial differentials, including nutrition and nursing. These researchers pointed to optimum time to teach reading. We learned then that we were more optimally likely to learn to read at three instead of five. Um, the implications for teaching of what is now STEM curriculum to implications for intelligence testing, the Head Start program, and culture and identity curriculum as core curriculum. But today, it is this third period which I want to put in the circle as another virulent form of the underbrush to which we must prepare and respond. It is this post-human genome project period that is now focused on a values and control worldview of selective breeding, cognitive genomics, and selective meritocracy today, evidencing an a priori assumptions and technocratic capacity for genetic engineering and the actual altering of the human germline. Um, just last month, 
About three weeks ago, a group of scientists, many of them who had directly or indirectly participated in the Human Genome Project, called for a moratorium on this kind of research because they had crossed over and reached the line um, and now, quote, have the potential to modify the next generation of genomes. They argue that this industry of human germline genetic engineering must not become dominated by privatized corporate interest without informed public guidelines. This underbrush of this era is informed by examining scientific journals and the U.S. Presidential Commission on Bioethics, which I would invite you to visit. And there you will see um, studies on pharma, pharmacological cognitive enhancement drugs like Ritalin and Adderall, implications for ADHD. You will see nutritional links correlated to antisocial behavior and predisposition to criminality and the use of uh, the ways in which omega-3 and fish diets could impact that. Um, you see expressions of the caution of the Beijing Genomics Institute, one of the largest sequencing facilities in the world, is noted as aggressively moving forward with um, this kind of research of embryonic sequencing and the United States response being concerned because it represents a different worldview who now have control of this kind of technology. Um, but there's a larger challenge for us in all of this bioethics, and it has to do with this tension between cultural worldviews. And so if we think it's over, it's not. Just two weeks ago, the reinvention of the U.S. Health Department Tuskegee research paradigm um, was revealed with a whistleblower report uh, reported to the U.S. Congress. Of the NIH discovered the Center for Disease Control uh, program around vaccines for autism impacting African American boys. The physical, moral, and soul injury, the trauma and terror we are experiencing as a direct result of the school to prison pipeline, mass incarceration, and the recycling of many in and out of prisons on any given day, we have to attend to, since now we know that two-thirds of those who go in prison with medications do not receive the medications while they're there, and then they come back to our communities. And so needless to say, the psychological terror of state-sponsored violence and public killings of our youth have only served to activate a youth movement and facilitate the linking of our struggles. Our youth are declaring the mantra of Asada, we have nothing to lose but our chains, and are claiming we charge genocide and Black Lives Matter. In short, the underbrush looks like a new world of selective breeding, cognitive genomics, and selective meritocracy. And I regret that, and Char I love you, but I regret that Charles Ogletree was not here because he has participated in a scenario around the scarlet gene in which the actual legal perspective of the implications of this technology is raising certain questions. So as we link our struggles and declare it's not about the humanity of the oppressed, but it is about the humanity of the controllers of the system of oppression, that is in question. We must hold tight to our collective identities and power to leverage all avenues and claims against this newest underbrush of race, human behavior, and genetic sciences. The indigenous Native American communities are probably furthest along in this regard. This session is significant because of that, and one of the things I thought about, because I am an honorary Navajo, that perhaps we collectively ought to become honorary uh, people of Native American communities so that we might leverage our collective power as a nation state. We have two panelists who are going to have to step out, and I appreciate that everyone else will be able to stay. Thank you so much. Let's give them uh, an applause. Jesse has to leave, and Robert, they have to take flights. We started a little late. Thank you. Um, Dr. Malik Burnett, how does current U.S. drug policy undermine the express goals of establishing community policing, particularly in minority communities? How would taking a more liberal approach to drugs and drug policy 
improve our society as a whole. And tell us who you are. Sure. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, wonderful discussion. I appreciate all the comments that have been provided thus far. Uh, and I am going to talk about uh, drug po the war on drugs specifically uh, and drug policy and how it uh, is the tie that binds, uh, as uh, Dr. King said, my name is uh, Malik Burnett. I am a policy manager at the Office of National Affairs uh, at the Drug Policy Alliance. The Drug Policy Alliance is the nation's leading organization working to uh, end the war on drugs and refocus drug policy from a criminal justice framework to a public health framework. Uh, and so if you look at the, the title of my uh, very short presentation, um, it is called The Tie That Binds, How the War on Drugs Undermines uh, the Promotion of the General Welfare or the American General Welfare. Um, and, and the way we're going to go through this is I'm just going to raise my hand uh, when I want you to click to the next slide. Awesome, thanks. Um, so in order to begin, I want to you know, put together some framing statements. Uh, and the first one points to the preamble of the Constitution. And you know, in the essence of time, I'm not going to read it. You guys can read it there. Um, but the bolded words are what I want to point you to uh, and the ideas of justice, tranquility, liberty, and the promotion of the general welfare. So as you think about those, those are the, the, the contexts under which the United States is, is governed and formed, and those are the ideals that we strive for as a nation. And when you think about the war on drugs, the war on drugs fundamentally undermines that. If we can go to the next forming statement, which is taken from the uh, World Health Organization, and it talks about the social determinants of health. And as you look at that statement, I want you to look at the bottom of that statement and look at the important phrase of how the distribution of money, power, and resources at the global, national, and local levels, uh, which are, and those, how those things are influenced by policy decisions. And so ultimately, when we're thinking about drug policy and the way that uh, uh, the policy is shaped and crafted, it's ultimately to promote health. But what we will see as I discuss this is that um, the policies do the exact opposite. Next slide. So this is a general overview. So as we've been talking about this, we've been looking for ways to, you know, generate funding for, you know, improving education. And uh, what we see is that in drug policy, we've spent approximately $1.5 trillion since 1986 to, with the ultimate goal of, you know, preventing uh, addiction and rehabilitating those who are addicted to the war on drugs. So you see two graphs there, one for uh, funding expenditures as captured by the Office of National Drug Control Policy and $1.5 trillion and the addiction rate uh, for drugs across all drugs in the United States. And so you see that the addiction rate has remained relatively flat, but we have spent um, approximately $1.5 trillion. And, if, and, and as you look at this, I want you to think about uh, you know, as we link our struggles, uh, where these resources are going to be coming to, you know, being reinvested in, in education and in a whole host of other issues that plague, you know, uh, communities of color, where those resources are going to come? Well, we have $1.5 trillion that we can use towards that. Next slide. So what I'm going to do is give an overview of three general areas, uh, police, immigration, and education. And we're going to start first with the police, if you could just click right through. Um, this is a very nice uh, linking uh, to expl explain how police militarization or policing has been blurred with uh, the military industrial complex. If you could click over to the next one uh, and the next one. What we have seen with policing is a gross uh, expenditure of resource or a gross investment in police militarization and police are able to get uh, military resources through three major programs, the 1033 Department of Defense uh, Industrial Program, the JAG Burn Grants Program, and since the uh, war on terror, the Department of Homeland Security all have injected approximately $40 billion in police equipment uh, since early 2000. If you could click the next two. And what you can see now is that we have uh, and a significant amount of police who look like military uh, uh, officials or uh, military forces, and they have become an occupying force within communities of color, and 
given the fact that they have acquired all of this equipment, it requires them to get a significant amount of training to use this equipment. And so with this training, we have now developed a police force that has become a shoot first police force and not a police force that works on uh, de-escalating situations, which is a large reason why you're seeing a significant amount of uh, police shootings uh, making the local news. Now, I want to be very clear, this has been occurring for quite some time. It is just a recent phenomenon that they have just become part of the major public discussion. Next slide. So I'm moving right into education uh, and talking about the school to prison pipeline. And you know, the beautiful thing about it is given the fact that I have a short amount of time, pictures say a thousand words. And so in addition to uh, the school to prison pipeline, uh, this is a very nice comedic sort of example between the you know, relationship between schools and prisons and you know, talking about models of education and you know, the uh, high, high, uh, uh, high stress testing uh, and how that compromises, uh, you know, the the, nat the notion of education and the ideas of, you know, being, bringing about independent thinking and, you know, um, uh, given the highly regimented structure of testing, um, that that is what the first picture shows. The second picture that I want to point out is that when we talk about school to prison pipeline, it is not just a pipeline that moves bodies from school to prison. It is a pipeline that moves funding from public education to the correctional uh, criminal justice system. So if you click the next one, so if you look at the uh, National Association of State Budgets, they have, they tracked from 1987 to 2007, uh, the spending on state budgets and prisons have gotten an increase in 127% in state budgets while public education has grown 21%. If you can click the next, slide, and this is in the context of every single state, this is every single state in the country, uh, the average amount of money that is required for the housing of prisoners is tremendously greater than the amount of money that it takes to educate a student. So in spite of this data, this is widely known, uh, we are seeing, due to the fact that we have a war on drugs, which you know is based on zero tolerance policy, which is kind of the underbedding, the undermining of you know how the school to prison pipeline works, uh, we are seeing an increase in the amount of uh, time or money being spent uh, in corrections, and that is at the cost of education. Next slide. So let's move quickly to immigration. This first slide looks at the flow of uh, both people and drugs from Latin America to the United States. Um, it, and I want to pay particular attention to the, what is known as the Golden Triangle, which is Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Next slide. Uh, and to point to two programs. So since 2000, two programs have been in occurrence in the United States, one called Plan Colombia and the other called the Meridian Initiative. This has injected approximately $40 billion since 2000 towards the militarization of Latin America and ultimately uh, the increasing of military presence in the, in the, uh, in the region. Next slide, next picture. When you inject in a significant amount of military spending, what you end up having is a significant amount of murder and death and carnage. And so what we can see here is the murder rate for uh, the Mexico, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, and Honduras. And so everyone who remembers the uptick in children who reached the border uh, in late uh, or in the summer of last year, uh, you all remember that there was a significant uptick in the number of children. All of these children originated from uh, these four uh, countries. And the United Nations Crime and Drug Office did a study which examined the uh, relationship between the murder rate and the immigration to the United States. And if you click the next slide, you will see that there is a perfect one-to-one -one correlation between the murder rate and the immigration to the United States. So it is clear at this point in time that the way that we are uh, handling our drug policy in the United States is ultimately undermining uh, the ability of us to have a stable immigration policy. Next slide. So there's a better path forward. Given all of what we've seen here, and I'm wrapping up, this is my last slide, uh, there's a better path forward. So the first one uh, that we look to, when we're looking at policy, we always, especially around drugs, we always turn to animal studies. And so uh, what you see here is called Rat Park. Rat Park is a uh, 
brilliant idea that uh, Professor Bruce Alexander from Simon Fisher University in British Columbia came up with about 30 years ago. And the concept of this is that when you take rats and you put them in a cage and you provide them with uh, you know, water that is infused with drugs and nothing else, they just use the drugs until they die. However, if you put them in a park where they are surrounded by their entire environment, they have food, interaction with other rats, they have you know, the ability to be surrounded with edifying sorts of things, they have very little interest in using the uh, drug-induced water. And so ultimately, this means that addiction as a, as a concept and model is not one of disease or one of you know, uh, criminality and loss in morality. It's a matter of resources being infused into communities which ultimately uh, need, are provided with uh, the resources that they need to ultimately be better. And if you look at the one last slide, we can see a real life human example of this in Portugal. In 2001, Portugal decriminalized all drugs. Uh, and since that time, you've seen a precipitous decline in the total, um, in, in the statistics that you know, would be uh, perceived as being uh, positive for the outcomes of health and public well-being in the, in the country. You've seen a 60% uh, drop in drug courts, 400% increase in the number of people going to rehab, a 20% de uh, decline in the pl prison population, and ultimately now, Portugal has the lowest drug use rate in, the, uh, in Europe. Uh, so it is possible to take um, drug policy, reform it, and put it in a way that we are emphasizing uh, public health and reinvestment in the community, take that $1.5 trillion, and ultimately do a whole bunch of good. So I thank you for your time, and you know, I appreciate the opportunity to come thank and talk you, about Thank you, Dr. This. Burnett. He is an MD doctor, not a talking doctor. Um, our last panelist is Stan Willis. And Stan, I'd like you to talk about this question. What forces were mobilized to get the UN Committee Against Torture to take a position on the local issue of police abuse in Chicago? And do you have any ideas why the US government responded to the United Nations Directive? Thank you, Dr. King. And tell us who you are. Um, I'm Standish E. Willis. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of our local scholars, uh, he's a labor lawyer, I can't think of his name now, just recently published a book on how to revive the labor movement in the United States. And his uh, conclusion or his treatise is that it will be revived by teachers. And I believe him after being in, in this audience. He said teachers and healthcare workers. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, police brutality. I'm a civil rights lawyer. Uh, my practice over 30 years has been suing uh, Chicago cops and not just suing the Chicago cops, but police in and around the Chicago area. Uh, and I've also been organizing in uh, primarily my community to deal with the mass incarceration of our people and to help uh, uh, black people to uh, be organized to fight against police violence in the black community. Um, Chicago, uh, you, you've been here a few days, you may have seen in the newspaper that Chicago uh, City Council and the mayor of Chicago is going to apologize on behalf of the people of Chicago for torturing over 100 black men and boys over a two and a half decade period. In addition to that, uh, they're going to provide a package of reparations to those victims and families, which would include free education, uh, a center for them, et cetera, et cetera. And that's very good. Um, John Bird was a police commander in Area 2. John Bird and over 50 white detectives tortured black men and boys over a two decade period. And when I say torture, I mean torture. Uh, they used electrical outlets to torture them. They had a, a box that they called the nigger box, and they would bring young boys, most of them under age 20, into Area 2 after a very 
serious, heinous crime had been committed in the black community, always a murder. And they would tell them, you're going to confess to this, or we're going to keep working on you, meaning we're going to take this electrical device, we're going to use these clips, and we're going to attach the clips to your testicles, to your nasal, to your, ear, your ears, and we're going to crank this device and emit electrical current into your body until you, t t t until you confess to a crime that you didn't commit. In addition to that, they would take uh, plastic bags, like garbage bags, and put it over the head of these young people until they suffocated, and then they revived them and say, are you ready to talk now? In addition to that, they used cattle progs, and I know most of y'all don't know what cattle progs are because you're from the city. <laughs> cattle progs is another electrical device that's used with cattle, where well, they would take that cattle prog and use it on our young people until they confessed. And they sent over 100 of them to prison. 10 of them were on death row. And if we had not organized and fall back, they would be dead now. And we did everything that was possible under democracy to get justice for the victims and to send the detectives to prison. And nobody would indict them. Uh, we had petitions, we filed lawsuits, we had city council hearings, we had county board hearings. Uh, we went to every agency that could prosecute and they turned a blind eye. And then finally, I convinced my colleagues to take this case before the United Nations and see what happens. Mm. And I got that. That didn't come from Stan Willis. I'm not that bright. I got that from my ancestors who tried to take the Negro question to the United Nations back in 1948. Mm. And they were pushed back on. Uh, and now we were able to take it to the United Nations. I went to Geneva, Switzerland, and I testified about the torture. And within seven months, after two and a half decades, within seven months, John Burge was indicted. And John Burge went to prison. But the problem is, he wasn't indicted for the torture. He was because the statute of limitations had run on the torture, so he's indicted for lying on interrogatories. He got four and a half years. All of our brothers got life. Mm -hmm. Tim was on death row. Mm -hmm. John Burge is out now still talking like he's crazy. Mm -hmm. So what we learn from that is that, and this is what connects our communities, mm -hmm. we are building a human rights movement in the United States. There's been a human rights movement in other parts of the country, and that's where we got the idea from. During the 60s and 70s, when I became of age, we knew that going before the United Nations with the apartheid, with the anti-colonial movement, uh, got attention. The United States don't like to be embarrassed. The United Nations can't do anything in the United States, but embarrass the United States. In addition to that, we draw on the, this disdain with what's happening in this country in the world community. And so an imperialist power always have to lie to the world about democracy because they're taking democracy to Iraq and taking democracy to, to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But then when we go to the world court, as Malcolm used to call it, mm -hmm. then we tell them that there's no democracy here for black people. Mm -hmm. And so within seven months, they indicted them because they wanted that off the front page. Mm -hmm. And so now we're building a movement. We're building a movement, a human rights movement. When I went to Geneva, there were over 100 American citizens there with issues. There were indigenous people there. There were people from all spectrums there. And in building the human rights movement, that means that we not only learn how to use the treaties that the United States have approved, and they haven't approved many of them, but we come back home and we help people in the communities to build this different paradigm by treating everybody as human and forcing our government to treat them as human. So I conclude by saying, oh, I got two minutes, so I don't have to conclude yet. <laughs> <laughs> I conclude by saying that I think we, can, we will connect because in the 60s, when I became of age, when I learned 
when I, when I uh, captured my African mind, as my sister mentioned, all right, all right. Uh, we began to look abroad. We began to study. We began to study African history. We studied Cuban history. We were four. We began to follow the movements. We knew who Cabral was. We, of course, knew who Mandela was, but Winnie Mandela. We followed everything internationally. Mm -hmm. And that forces our people to begin to look at immigration because that's an international issue and become involved in immigration. Because, you know, if you're talking about just supporting people of African descent, then you support people all over the Western Hemisphere. There are more African people in Brazil than in the United States. I know, I know we think we're the only African people in, the, in, in, in this Western Hemisphere. There are African people in Colombia if, if that's the criteria. So I think we connect by building this human rights movement. The United States don't want this human rights movement. That's why we have to build this human rights movement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give the panel a real big applause. Thank you. We tried to do a lot because the problems are huge. Our topic was Given the historical evidence of education and justice, what are alternatives for linking our struggles? And how can our education and education research inform strategies for affecting a different future? And I think, thank the panel for giving us a vision of what is possible. Another world is possible, as we say in that movement. So we're going to make a switch I'm going to invite the panelists to come down into the audience. I'm going to invite the audience to come up close one more time. And Congressman Honda has agreed to stay with us for a few more minutes to share uh, more information about his work in Congress. Please don't leave. We have an opportunity to hear from one of our elected representatives, and it would be great um, if he has an audience. So the congressman is going to stay on. It'll take us about 20 minutes, and then you'll have a chance, if you want to, to connect with some of the panelists who are still here. So thank you very much for being here, and get up, stretch, and come up closer. Please, thank you.